So thank you very much for coming. We have another seminar today. This time we have uh, Gonzalo Ruz. He's a professor here at the University of Kibayas. And he will be talking about mineral exploration through data mining results from, a, from the north of Chile. My project here is exactly. data mining. Okay, so thank you, Rodrigo. I'm, um, I'm very happy for, for the invitation and quite delighted actually to be uh, considered to give this talk. So, um, so most of you guys know me and people that don't, um, I guess in the past three or four years, my main research has been concentrated in computational biology. So it's totally different from this. But um, given the nature of this group, um, I think it would be more appropriate um, to present some of the other stuff I do, more applied, on, uh, on data mining. And specifically, I'll, I'll be talking about um, a project uh, which uh, took place during the end of 2012 and 2013. Um, it was a joint venture between the university and an uh, Israeli company, which I'll give more details. And um, so some interesting uh, things came out, some not that much, but you'll see. So this work is um, uh, basically, uh, I don't think we've been able to, to um, to conduct it without the help of these two other um, partners, research partners. Um, Sergio Rica, who's also a professor here at the Faculty of Engineering, his background is mostly on, on physics, nonlinear uh, dynamics, but um, he's a really good guy at uh, modeling and conducting simulations in computers, so um, he actually was quite useful for this project. And on the other, uh, on the right side is Mauricio Valle, who's, uh, who did his PhD here at the university at the Management Science uh, Program. And um, his background is mostly on um, management and also data mining. I was, I was a co-supervisor of his uh, doctoral work, and um, so he gained quite a bit of experience in, in data mining and data pre-processing. And uh, currently, he's in the business school of the uh, University of Finisterra here in Santiago. So uh, these were the two main collaborators from the from the U from the university here. From the from the company, I'll I'll talk a little bit about the people that that collaborated there. But these two are were essential in this project. Um, okay, so the outline of this talk, I'll probably at the beginning, I'll give a general description of of the actual data mining project. Then I'll, um, I'll talk a little bit about the data, and then actually the, the models that we, we applied for, the, for this problem, and, um, and then some conclusions at, at the end. Okay, so here just a, a few as an introduction. So uh, mineral uh, deposit exploration in, in the greenfield aspect, which is basically you're searching for new areas or new deposits, not uh, there's also brownfield, which is actually um, associated to already existing deposits. So here the idea was, is actually to find new uh, deposits, copper deposits specifically. And the general, um, you could probably say, a priori uh, probability of actually having a success, uh, at least here in Chile, is roughly between 1 in, in 1,000. And... Um, and because it's high risk to, uh, um, to invest in, 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 in this uh, area because uh, usually you don't find anything and um, drilling and everything is very expensive. So basically what we see here is that companies don't actually invest that much in, um, in targeting or, or exploring, roughly about $300,000 per year, which is a very small amount compared to, to the numbers that usually are involved in the, in the mining is, industry. Also, in Chile in particular, most of the mining companies um, outsource their uh, exploration to what are called um, juniors. Yeah, so juniors are actually uh, the small companies that, that conduct um, this uh, mineral exploration or targeting. Okay, so that's what happens here in Chile. And, um, and, and so this project, uh, I'll talk about the, the client. The, the project was basically... Um, uh, the client is a Quantum Pacific Group, which is actually a holding, which has several companies. They all have Quantum Pacific and then another surname. And, and their main, um, their strength is in shipping, uh, sea transport, and um, also deep water drilling for gas and, and oil. And also they're into the electric car industry in China and so on. They have several businesses. 
and I would say late 2011, early 2012, the company, um, they, they wanted to go into the mining business, right? And, and for them, they, and they wanted to go into the mining business, but uh, going through all the process from exploration, then, and then actually um, building, the, uh, installing the mine, whatever, the production, all the logistic, and then the transport. I mean, they want to do the whole cycle. And, and so they wanted to start with uh, exploration, but they didn't want to do, they didn't want to apply a traditional exploration approach. They wanted to uh, make use here of innovative approaches to mineral exploration. This actually introduces into, uh, to use what's called, what they call uh, the discovery room approach, okay? So this is an Israeli uh, company. Their headquarters are in, in London though. And most of the people that work there have military background. They, they, they all, um, uh, some of the, especially the, the people who are working in this uh, new mining area from the company, they all have very high positions in, in, in uh, Israeli uh, military uh, division, force uh, intelligence uh, division. So they wanted to apply their techniques to mineral exploration. And what they call it is something, an approach called the discovery room, where they, uh, dis they uh, assign different teams uh, with a different expertise to tackle the same problem, and then you have every month or so meetings where these teams you uh, join together and they discuss their findings and then afterwards see how they can complement their their res their results and and so we were um, we were associated to them in order to uh, give the data mining part so this discovery room had a, a traditional uh, geology unit where they had geologists and so on geophysics uh, physicists, sorry, and, and so it, they, they wanted to tackle the problem using s different approaches, different approaches, some which were more traditional, some non-traditional, like in our case using uh, data mining, uh, but without any mining experience in the, in the sense of uh, exploration, rocks, not, not data. Uh, so, so here basically they approach us early 2012, and, um, and then this project actually took place, I would say the, the more, the principal part was mostly during the first semester of 2013. And, um, and then this business, then this company, they, they actually, um, the holding decided to, to create a, a company here, which is called uh, Quantum Pacific Exploration. It has the QPX um, letters to, uh, for the company, they're located here in Santiago, in the um, uh, these tower, these new towers. In um, I'll remember afterwards, but it's in um, uh, near near Costanera Center. Um, huh? Titanium, yeah, one of the titanium towers. Okay. Um, Okay, so the main objective of, of this project was essentially uh, to predict to create. Uh, predictive model uh, capable of defining areas of, of interest and um, what we'll see and, and able to find world-class deposits okay the definition for them for world-class deposit was essentially to find a deposit of uh, one million uh, one billion tons and 0 0.5 grade you know, of, of copper and the search uh, was basically the regions which are pointed out here. I have a map afterwards, so we, we can go into more detail. And the project originally was uh, between mid-August and January. And um, so I put this because this was the original case, but actually, um, actually this, the, the, the more formal data mining actually started in January because um, the data wasn't ready. So that's the first thing about um, data mining projects. You, it's always good to plan. Five months is more than enough time, but um, if you have the data from the start. In this case here, uh, the data we'll see was uh, loaded onto a GIS system, and, uh, and that was a very slow process of validating the data and so on. So actually to do the formal data mining predictive models, it was only carried out at the very end, January and March probably of, uh, of 2013, okay? Um, 
So the, the specific objectives were, first of all, to identify the key attributes or features, variables or so on, associated to world-class deposits and non-world-class deposits. Uh, also, being able, the capacity to identify which of the data layers of this GIS system uh, had a significant impact in the, in the prediction. And also, the idea was to create a, um, a platform which was able to uh, sort of like an open source platform where you could uh, run the models and make it cloud-based and able to, um, to actually uh, improve the, the development. So, and, and although the project started very late or so on, I think we were able to, to tackle all of these um, specific objectives. So from that part, I think the project was uh, successful. And the general, I won't go into much detail on this, the general outline of, of the project uh, the mythology was uh, carrying out what's called the CRISP-DM method, which is basically the cross-industry standard process for data mining, where essentially the whole project is conducted in six stages. But I would say, well, the initial two are pretty simple, which is called the business understanding, where you define the business objectives, but also the data mining objectives, meaning you know, what, what level of precision does the model have to have and, and so on then to see what was the actual data that was going to be available for the project. Um, and so this, I think, was pretty fast at the beginning, but then um, uh, this here was actually never uh, fully, the data was never fully loaded until the very end. And then this part here, this takes quite a bit of time because here, uh, because of this uh, data which was constantly being updated, then uh, the pre-processing and modeling, as it's uh, drawn here, there's sort of like a cycle. So this part here, actually it was quite a lot of work. There was a lot of work in pre-processing and then modeling uh, using the different data mining techniques which we'll talk later on. And, and then evaluation was, uh, we'll see there are standard measures for evaluate, uh, evaluating the, the performance of the model and then finally deployment is basically to see uh, the actual platform that was going to work for this, for this project. Okay, so as, as I stated before, the area of interest where data was going to come from was from the, for these four regions here. And um, probably the people here in the audience who are not from Chile, someone from Chile can try and explain why, the, the, you know, <laughs> it's very strange. So, and and uh, this is actually outdated. Now we have, I think, uh, 16th. So, you know, it's dynamic and, um, and you know, it's, it's difficult. I, to find the actual rule for assigning the, the actual numbers of, of the regions. But so on, the, the area of interest is, is this zone here. And, um, and also, so, and the data for the project was basically to construct a geographic information system, uh, which is basically different data layers, uh, which uh, basically had geological information, gravity, magnetics, and so on, geophysics. The idea here also was to actually have some a typical data layer for, for, for this type of project, like having a more uh, biological data as well and so on, but at least until, uh, until the part where, up to the part where we uh, reached, uh, we only had um, the more traditional uh, data for, for mineral exploration. I, I'm guessing now they've filled this up with more interesting data. And, um, and as we see here, the, uh, the area that was actually where the data was uh, complete corresponds roughly a bit more than 160,000 square kilometers. Okay. Yes? Yes, yes. Yeah, I'll, I'll, and the pre-processing, part of the pre-processing as well. And, and so the actual um, data layers that we used for this project were, were this one here, which was essential, of course, to have nine existing nine deposits. This was actually the first data layer that was loaded on the GIS, and that was the only data available for several months at the beginning. So the first um, technique that I will show uh, was basically using only the information of existing uh, nine deposits. Then afterwards, uh, we had uh, this uh, digital elevation model, which is basically uh, plots of uh, 3D surface, uh, gravity, magnetics, faults. Actually, this layer here, faults, was the second layer that was loaded on, on the GIS. 
Um, and then, yes, these other uh, layers with, uh, with uh, geological information, basically types of rocks and so on. Um, okay, and so for the data mining techniques that we'll see later on, uh, essentially, we, we need to model, um, we model this uh, with a grid uh, on, on uh, covering the north of Chile. Initially, each cell of this grid was 10 kilometers from, uh, 10 by 10 kilometers. Uh, and this, then this fluctuated to smaller uh, 5 by 5 or even 1 by 1 and so on. And, and the idea here is basically from these different data layer from each cell, each one of these cells would compute an, an attribute vector, which is roughly like a centroid uh, for each one of these cells. Uh, you would have an attribute vector computing attributes from the different layers, and these were our features used in the data mining, uh, using the data mining algorithms to, to carry out the prediction. Um, here, just here, I think some of these black dots were representing where existing deposits were and so on. And then uh, these type of attributes at the beginning were quite simple, basically some descriptive statistics uh, for some of the layers, the mean value, standard deviation, gradients, especially for, um, for the DEM and also um, gra gravity layer, magnetic layer, sorry. And also for the faults, uh, basically the length and the number of faults that were in each of one of these squares. Those were the type of attributes that we computed. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, before, before, okay, before. Actually, I, in the, in, yeah, before, actually, in, um, they're in, now the, the company is in the drilling phase. They first need to identify what they call areas, areas of interest. Um, and because drilling is very expensive, so so basically, first they need to narrow down to interesting areas, areas of interest, and then then uh, you, somehow you have to repeat this process in a more smaller, narrowing down the area until then uh, you can start doing the the drilling. Okay, so this here is basically a more like a, a previous stage. Okay, where you have more a larger area, you want to identify lar larger areas, and then you go in more specific. Okay. Um, so, in the beginning, you, for each cell, we were able to compute roughly about 308 attributes, okay? So, there's lots, lots, lots of variables. Uh, but at the end, if you analyze most of these variables, some were highly correlated, others were, had uh, lots of missing values, uh, and therefore, um, when we look at our, afterwards, our models, most of them will, will use only 10, 15, 20 attributes, um, up to 50 in some simulations, but n in no case we would use all of these because many of these attributes were highly correlated, so there were attributes that were measuring the same information, basically, or had a significant amount of uh, missing values. Uh, so therefore, also uh, some attributes that were almost constant, they had constant values for, for everything, so they don't have, um, they don't give you too much information for your, for, for your prediction purposes. So, so several of these attributes were actually discarded, okay? Okay, yes? They, they were computed on, on the GIS and, and also, also um, data exported from the GIS and computed use and on Python, okay? And, um, yeah. So, um, like I was talking at the beginning, this project, um, as many data mining projects, suffer from the essential part, which is the actual data. So, when this started, the first layer that was loaded on the GIS and somehow validated uh, was the actual, the first layer which we saw with the mineral and deposits, uh, known deposits, existing deposits. So um, this project started in August and then it was like November and we had discovery room meetings and so on. We wanted to present some, some results but we didn't have any data, only the existing uh, deposits. So we started as um, good uh, engineers and scientists and so on. We started to do some research and we came across very quickly with, um, ah, this is also something um, which is 
doesn't really happen in real data mining projects. When you when you conduct data mining project, you want someone in the team who actually has some knowledge of the domain of the problem you're working with. Here with this data uh, discovery room approach, the idea was that each group worked independently, uh, only applying their knowledge from their own background and so on, and then in this discovery room, you would cross results and see, and then probably integrate then more uh, people with more expertise. So in, in our case, we none of us were expert in mining and we couldn't differentiate between one rock or another and so on. So um, so it was strange because um, you know some results that we obtained were, I don't think that were very good, but some were apparently were interesting. So anyway, so here um, when we had, when we only had the, no, uh, the information of the existing uh, deposits, uh, we came across very quickly that um, these deposits actually don't appear randomly, uh, apparently. They, they, they tend to appear in groups, in clusters, okay? And, they, um, and so, therefore, you're able to compute what's called a, a fractal dimension, okay? And if you're able to compute a fractal dimension, then you can also compute a distribution, a fractal distribution. So we started looking at several works uh, where you would find... Um, and also power laws associated. So it was actually good to have a physicist in, in our group because this was more of his domain. So he was quite happy. Sergio was quite happy working on this. And, um, and so apparently fractals and power laws are useful to predict actually location of mineral deposits. Um, as you see, so there are several works where they, they tend to, to, to look at this. So we, we started... Um, so uh, basically, well, fractal dimension is basically, uh, or, or a set is called fractal, the, the data point distribution, if it exhibits so um, a scale invariance, of course. In other words, the distribution pattern looks the same at a range of different magnifications. And, and for this, it's possible actually to compute the fractal dimension, which is the characterization, uh, through what's called the box counting method, which is very simple. Um, so first, this is actually the first data that was loaded on the GIS. It actually had no, here we don't distinguish between sizes of, of deposits. So here we have actually uh, deposits which were very small and others big, but we actually wanted the, the X and Y points uh, location. We have here, the, even also we have, um, to have more data, we included not only the copper deposits, but also um, silver, gold, and, and iron at, at the end. And um, this was actually, this only covers only a portion of the north of Chile, which we, which I, I showed earlier, okay? Only um, the, the more south part. And, and so first we wanted to, to, to see, uh, we computed a radial distribution, which is basically this, um, um, this value here, which is actually the number of deposits between standing in one point and then varying the distance in the, the, the radius in a small fraction. And then you start um, making bigger and bigger the, this, uh, the size of, of this DR, or differentiate um, radius. And so if you plot that, um, here, the, sorry, the, this is R here, and this is actually a density. The important part here of this uh, plot here is this part here up to here roughly, where you have sort of like a, a characteristic um, length of 30 kilometers roughly. Then this starts dropping down because of um, the larger you go and then you have less mines. So basically the significant part here of this curve is here. Uh, and uh, this part here we will see actually has a, a fractal uh, behavior. So what we see mostly here is that you up to 30 kilometers you tend, you tend to have um, uh, another deposit between that limit, between where you are and, and up to 30 kilometers. Is that from, uh, from other deposits? Sorry? So you have a deposit? Yeah, all of, yeah, all of these are deposits. Yeah. Okay, so and this is so it's appeared the distance between our deposits. And um, here, then afterwards, if you, if you apply the box counting method on this, which is basically you find that there is, um, if you have a pattern that you want to find the fractal dimension in two dimension here in 2D, then the number, um, the number of boxes 
is basically inversely proportioned to uh, to the size of these uh, the size of these boxes. This um, exponent here, d, is actually the what's called the fractal dimension. And in, in this, if you do a log log plot, then this is actually a, a line, and where the where the slope is the actual fractal dimension. So if we take a portion of the data. And, and plot it, do the log log with this technique, then actually we find that it, there are some um, areas where this is actual fractal. So it actually has a fractal behavior. And um, so if this has a fractal behavior, then we were able to fit the following uh, density, this here. This here is, is a, um, a density, uh, this df is the actual fractal dimension. If you see here, if uh, df is two, is basically when you have fractal dimension two, this means that covers the whole uh, the whole surface. So therefore, the probability of finding a deposit is one, and you can actually find a deposit just by doing random walk, although it's very expensive. But you eventually will find a deposit. Um, and so what you're looking for here is essentially you want uh, you want a, a fractal dimension which is near near to two. And um, and so in this case here, if you plot then using this using uh, using this density here and adjust the data points to this form, then what you find here is the actual uh, is this is a constant divided by x to a power of zero point five. So here is essentially the fractal dimension here is one point five. Which is quite interesting because we'll see later on that um, 1.5 is like looking for a deposit would be like looking for a needle in a haystack probably or a button in a haystack. 1.5 uh, fractal dimension is like um, like a bent wire, but you're looking for like a bent wire in a in a, in a haystack. So it's still difficult, but not as difficult as looking for a small ne for a needle. Okay. Um, and so here, this is the same. This is the same plot as before, but on a log-log scale. You, you see here there are there are certain areas where this actually has the fractal behavior. Um, yeah. Uh, so this is actually an example of a, a shape that has fractal dimension uh, 1.5. So it's like a bent wire essentially. Um, this is here, uh, if you consider the two, the, uh, if we consider also the, the gold, uh, and so here we find for the gold has um, fractal dimension uh, one, and uh, if we consider both uh, data points, the copper and gold, the total, it has uh, 1.2. Okay, if you put, uh, that's the same as here. Okay, so what can we do with uh, once we found that this has a fractal distribution, we can actually compute a probability density field of, of uh, in this case for copper using the copper x and y points. So here, essentially, we can using the the this here, the density here, we can then compute by adding up, standing from each deposit, computing the distance to the other known deposits, and taking the sum of these probabilities. And this will give you what's called a, uh, like a density field, and where here we'll have this is um, x and y location, and here's the, the density. You'll find regions where, where you have higher density, higher probability of finding deposits. This is the same graph, it looked from top. And, and so it's interesting because you'll find the black dots are actually the copper deposits. And, and so here it's interesting because you'll still find, you'll still see there are some areas where. Uh, you, you, you probably expect to have more points here, and there, and there are none at the moment. So, so this here is, is interesting, uh, probably areas of interest to, to analyze. We'll, we'll see later on that actually this could be combined with some other predictions and to pinpoint better uh, regions. So um, this is with the copper, this is with the gold, with the gold deposits, and... Um, no, and that's about it here. So this was the, actually the first approach we, we used, uh, knowing only the x and y coordinates of the existing um, deposits. Then later on, the second uh, layer that was loaded were the faults. And the faults also have a fractal uh, uh, dimension characteristic. So then we were able, the following steps we used were to, um, to actually build joint distributions between the deposits and the faults. 
And if we have the joint distributions, then we could compute conditional distributions for, for prediction purposes. And, um, and so there we got some results, but they weren't that, they were okay, I guess. They, they were useful for the presentations and so on, but I did not put them here now. But essentially, um, the faults and uh, gravity and uh, deposits, they all have this uh, fractal dimension property, which then can be useful to build these distributions here. Okay. Yes? So yeah. Yes. Yes, the actual deposit. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah? Why do you use that formula? Some problems could be natural. No, but in the scale, yeah, well, I, I could probably go into more specific. It, the, we used a truncated version. So we were actually made sure that um, it didn't sum one. Okay. Hmm? And, and how do you incorporate the fact that in, in this case you only have uh, positive uh, detection of mm -hmm. one, but maybe you have places where you know that there is no. Correct. This information is not. Uh, no, for this part here, we only what, exactly the information you're talking about. It will be used in the following models. Yeah, for for this part here, you only consider. Uh, places where you have um, the X and Y coordinates of known deposits. Okay. Yeah, well, so the, yeah. It's difficult, yeah, because most exactly for the following, well, we'll see the other two techniques. We use the two, in the known deposit, and also we had a few category, a few known cells where we know that they're they've done drilling and so on, and apparently it's known to have known deposits. But many of the other cells are basically unknown, really. We don't we don't know, yeah, so it's difficult. Okay, so so the next stage was basically now using the the, the other layers, and uh, for that we first used a, a clustering approach, uh, and here we use self-organizing maps. So a quick word on self-organizing map, also known as Cohonan maps as well. Um, here essentially, so as we talked before, each each one of these cells was going to be characterized by a, a large group of attributes. And the idea here in self-organizing map is that basically these attributes, which is a point in the n-dimensional space, are non-linearly projected to a two-dimensional grid. And this is done basically, this grid here, each one of these uh, are actual neurons uh, from the artificial neural network um, paradigm. And um, here, each one of these neurons has a prototype vector associated, which is basically uh, a vector of the same dimension as the data in the input space and the algorithm will see moves around these prototype vectors in order to model somehow the, the the density of the distribution of the input data and then afterwards when it's finished uh, each data point is projected to the cell to the neuron where it's closest to the prototype okay and um, it's the algorithm is actually some type of um, quantum uh, a vector quantization, but it has this neighborhood function which preserves the topology, which means two points in the input space that are neighbors end up neighbors also in the output space in the two-dimensional uh, grid. Okay, so and what's interesting about this technique is once you've projected the input patterns onto this output grid, then you can color this grid. Uh, selecting one of the features or so on, and then you could see if this feature has discriminatory power between uh, for, 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 between the different clusters, or in this case here, we're interested in to separate between cells that have known deposits and cells with uh, no deposits or don't know, if you want to use that word. Uh, and so how this algorithm works is very simple. You, these prototype vectors are initialized randomly, then we select an input a vector, uh, and then uh, you determine the winning neuron, also known as the best matching unit, uh, basically by Euclidean distance uh, between the uh, vector and the prototype. And then you update you update the positions of the prototype using this updating rule. Here, essentially, 
the, this part here is the most important one here, which is this neighborhood function, which is defined on the output grid, and which enables you then to update only the prototypes which are in the neighborhood of your output grid, uh, and the ones, if you're too far away from the winning neuron, then uh, the other prototypes are not updated. And then this goes on and on until convergence. Convergence is essentially when the prototype vectors don't, don't change. Okay? Now this here does not have um, the converge. It doesn't have a, a, fo a formal converg convergence proof. I, I could guess that because there is this actually is not optimizing anything explicitly. Although if you could you can generate a probabilistic model version where you actually are maximizing the likelihood and so on. But um, this algorithm is very popular because uh, it works essentially. <laughs> Um, and so here I can only give you practical requirements for convergence. Well, this learn, learning rate here, this parameter here, essentially has to move between zero and one, it has to be monotically decreasing, this essentially. And a typical example for this function is this one here, a, a, an exponential, decreasing the exponential, and where u and b are parameters that the user has to set. And for the neighborhood function, also moves between 0 and 1. It has a monotically decreasing radius. And a typical here is use a Gaussian function for each output, neuron of the output. So once you apply this algorithm, um, well, typical applications here is dimension redu redu reduction, sorry, data analysis exploration, um, typical application visualizing high dimensional data in 2D. And so this is useful for cluster analysis and client segmentation and so on. Okay, so with the data, um, with, with the data here, uh, basically each cell of the north of Chile, the map we saw earlier where we had this grid on top of, of Chile, um, was characterized in this case here by 14 attributes. Okay, remember we had 308 attributes and so on for each cell. Well, at the end from those there, we selected uh, 14, which were more informative, using uh, uh, how they correlated with the output and so on. And these came from the following layers, magnetics, geology, and geologic units, sorry, gravity, the DM, and the faults. And, and so here, once, here the output grid of the SOM is a 20 by 20 uh, map. Each uh, big large circle here is one of the neurons that we saw in the, in the figure before. And here, once all the data points were projected onto this grid, uh, the small black circle represents cells that correspond to uh, places where no deposits or non-known deposits are. And the uh, red triangles are, corresponds to cells where um, known deposits exist. And so the first thing we see here is that basically these 14 attributes have some type of discriminatory power because we see, although we have red triangles spread out at different places, there is a major concentration in this area here. And, um, well, these numbers here are, are just um, tags, labels to identify the neuron. And, and here what's interesting is that each data point that ends up in the same neuron, they're neighbors, but they're neighbors not spatially, but in the attribute space. So what's interesting here is to see um, the known deposits which uh, end up in the same neuron, and, and, and they're, uh, spatially they're located at different places, we'll see. Uh, nevertheless, in their feature space, they're, they're very similar. And so what's interesting here, if you look at neuron 304, for example, is that in this neuron you have known deposits, points, but also you have points which are black, which are the one from the cells where non-deposit non or non-known deposits exist. So those are interesting cells to analyze because they have, in their attribute space, they have characteristics similar to known deposits. And so they also have attribute features with this very similar characteristics. And nevertheless, there are places where um, the, the, they haven't explored. So these here are, are, are candidates to look for. Okay. And um, also, I haven't put here, but we also we were able to color the map selecting different, some different, different uh, features from here and see if they had discriminatory power and so on. 
most of them at gravity and faults were very, quite interesting. Okay? But here, this is like the, a clustering approach where essentially we try to identify cells where they have similar behavior in their attributes with known deposits. Okay? Yes? No. No. X, X, X and Y is not used. Only attribute space. So here we are uh, people who, who work, know a little bit of uh, existing minds. So uh, here you'll see, for, here's the neuron number, and here I have the names of the existing uh, uh, deposits in these neurons. And so some of them are very quite far apart, spatially, okay? And here's uh, the neuron 304, which we discussed before, uh, which contained these three uh, um, the area uh, mines uh, and um, and also in this neuron here we saw that there were um, a, a few cells black uh, black circles uh, small circles which are corresponds to cells that um, uh, have non known deposits so that would be candidate um, cell points to to analyze okay um, so this technique actually was very um, had very good reception in in the discovery room meetings by the geologists because there were um, because it's clustering and so it's a non-supervised uh, technique where we're not imposing any any restrictions on um, on uh, on uh, selecting which were the known uh, non-known and so on. Is the, this is only projecting the data with the features onto a two-dimensional grid um, and seeing to and being able to identify uh, you know similar points which from one class and the other any doubts yes. okay so What's good about this method is other clustering techniques, you have to start selecting the number of clusters beforehand. For example, k-means, which is the most probable. You have to, here, basically, I'm not imposing any number of clusters. I'm just projecting the data and seeing how they actually group together uh, without the need of um, applying k, uh, the number of k. Of course, after this, uh, we actually use k-means also, but uh, defining the number of clusters it wasn't that simple. Um, then you could also use um, expectation maximization, for example. Uh, but for this amount of data, for the number of data and so on, is a bit slow. And, but yes, it could have been an option. But this here, because it has the visual component, so it's, it was actually um, um, it had a good reception by the, by the client. So, um, but yes, you could combine it with other clustering techniques. Yes. Okay. Okay, and so the, the, the last uh, technique that we applied uh, were supervised learning techniques. Here, you need a training set which contains uh, each one of these feature uh, features has to be, uh, feature vectors has to be labeled beforehand with a set of uh, known deposits and a set of uh, non, uh, uh, known non deposits or uh, or just don't know really, but uh, the, you know from from the cells we saw before we have identified cells which has known deposits the other cells are candidates or Only a few amount we actually knew that were non uh, known non deposits, okay, and, and so for here we we use classifiers we actually tested several um, decision trees um, K and N, the K nearest neighbors, and so on. I would say in, in precision and for prediction, probably this uh, support vector machines together with a uh, random forest were the ones that obtained the best performance. Um, so only a quick word on, 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 on SVMs. This probably, you know, if SVMs will probably be a, a whole other seminar to talk about SVMs. Essentially here, the input space, these dots here represent, so the two classes, the two categories I want to be able to discriminate between. Known deposits and, and the other known non-deposits, or no deposits if you want. And, and so if we look in the input space here, uh, because this is a difficult problem, ideally what you would want in this classification problem is for those both classes to be linearly separable, 
Therefore, you could you only need a, a hyperplane and so on, very simple, and, and separate them. But in the real world, most of them will be mixed together. So you, for this classification problem, you need to define a nonlinear decision boundary. Okay, and, and so SVMs are very good for this because um, SVM essentially what it does. Uh, each one of these points here does a nonlinear transformation into what's called a feature space, which is a higher dimension than, than the actual input data, uh, through a, a mapping, a nonlinear mapping, it, it, to go from the input space to the feature space. And when you're in this feature space, then uh, because you're in a higher dimension here, eventually you'll find, you'll reach a point where you'll find um, uh, linearly separable. Uh, and so here you can define uh, an optimal hyperplane to separate, which is plotted here. And this is done event essentially by transforming this problem into an optimization problem, which is uh, solved using quadratic, uh, quadratic, um, quadratic programming, okay? Uh, to define the parameters of these, which are called the support vectors, which define these uh, hyperplanes, which it gives the largest margin between one category and, and the other, okay? So it's actually quite a neat problem because um, for us from the machine learning point of view, the optimization stage, we look at it as basically a black box. We, we use any technique off the shelf uh, that the, uh, to solve the quadratic programming uh, problem, okay? No, well here, that's, that's a good question because here, this mapping here to do this, we don't actually need an explicit function. It's done, that's, they use here what's called the kernel trick, which is basically here when you formalize the, 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 the cost function or the, or the optimization function that you want to, um, has a dot product between uh, two of the points using this transform, this mapping, nonlinear mapping. And actually, that dot product can it be actually summarized, can be computed through the kernel. And so there you define the kernel, a Gaussian, or so on. So it's actually it's simple. Okay. Yeah, well, there are parameters. Yeah, that's one of the draw. Yeah, there are parameters that. Yeah, yes. There's a, there's a parameter, C parameter, which is the cost. Uh, and there are several others. Yeah. Yeah. So. But it's, and nowadays, I would say one of the one of the most um, powerful classifiers, I would guess, is uh, our SVMs, together with random forests. And uh, for this project, the output of the SVM, which is only a decision boundary here to decide if you're one category or the other, uh, the output we you could actually um, there's an algorithm to uh, train uh, to put a sigmoid function model in order to have outputs between zero and one. So therefore you actually can have also like a probability instead of, of just a hard decision boundary, okay? So uh, here then a big issue occurs because uh, basically in many data mining projects, what usually happens is that the class that you're interested in predicting here, for example, the uh, deposit, usually in your training set, you'll have more examples of uh, the things that you don't want to predict, like here, no deposit, versus actually finding a deposit. This also happens when you're designing uh, fraud detection systems and so on. You have more examples of uh, non-fraud than actual fraud. And when you want, when you're training these classifiers, uh, you, uh, you, well, the, you, you desire that the actual training set is balanced, meaning you have the same number of examples, of the positive class here, the, the known uh, the no existing deposit versus the negative class, which we here we'll call the no deposits, okay? And, and so here, one approach is basically to undersample the, the majority class to level up to the, to the positive class. Uh, and we, we tried that, but the positive class, we had only like using world-class deposit uh, mine, mines, uh, we only had like 60 or, or roughly about 40 points or 60 points, and, uh, and therefore the, the data set was reduced significantly. Uh, and so basically, I would say a very popular technique now in the past three years or four, maximum five, I would say, although it existed way before, but it's become very popular now, is called the, sm the smoke. Uh, technique, which is um, 
which is, is uh, an oversampling approach where basically the minority class, you, you generate artificial data from the minority class. And it's done in a very clever way, essentially from the minority class. It uh, applies uh, the k-nearest neighbor algorithm to find uh, the, the, the k-nearest neighbors of your minority class. Then you select one of these neighbors randomly and you interpolate between those two to generate a new data point, okay? Uh, essentially, graphically, is we could see it here. Here we have the minority class, uh, the circles, and so here is like a, a zoom of this area. And, and basically here you look for your, for, your, um, for your K nearest neighbors and so on, and then you, between the, between the two, you generate a synthetic, uh, an artificial new data point. And what's interesting is this artificial new data point, if you analyze the actual vector afterwards, it has the characteristics of uh, somehow the, the type of uh, mine or, or attributes that you would expect to find also in, in, a, in a deposit. So therefore, these are, these are rather clever artificial da data points. So with this technique here, essentially you're able to oversample the minority class using the SMOTE technique. And then you also undersample the majority class randomly, usually, in order to balance your, your sets, okay? This whole technique, do you think, I mean, do you consider the points that are the process, for example, like that? Do you consider them when you're creating No, this no, no, yeah. sorry. No, you're, you're only looking at your, from the, the minority class. Okay, so if there is a cross in the middle of that, of that uh, road, I mean, one of the things you're, you're linking, we put a sample or a cross. Right, so you're saying if you add like a point here, for example, you put a line here, yeah, yeah eventually it could happen, yeah. Yes. And okay, so this part here I could probably go uh, quick in order to, mod to measure the, the performance of the model. We use the standard, well we do, k fold and fold cross validation, which is essentially the training set is partitioned into ten blocks, and uh, and so one block is left outside, and you use the other nine to train. Then you test, you evaluate the model with the one you left out. Then you return this block, and you take another one out. You train with the nine and evaluate in the the one that you left out, and you repeat that ten times, and you take the average. So that way. All the data set used in your, for your training is, is actually being used also for train and to, uh, to, to test at the same time, okay? Um, and then for each one of these um, predictions, then you, con you construct the confusion matrix where essentially it's like a contingency matrix where you have um, each, in these positions here, you have the ones, the true positives, which is the number of predictions that you're actually were able to uh, correctly predict for the, the true, the positive class, which is here, the, the known the deposits, and the negative class will be the no deposits, okay? So in the diagonal, you have the success where you've done the correct prediction. Outside the diagonal, you have the cases where you failed. And so you either have a false negative or a false positive. And so from, from this matrix here, you can compute the measures of uh, essentially the correct classification uh, or also known as accuracy, which is basically sum the diagonal of the matrix divided by all the, all the data, all the other numbers. You have the precision is actually to see how good your classifier is in predicting the, the class that you're interested in, in this case here, the, the positives. And also you have the recall, which is a proportion of positive cases that were correctly identified, okay? So it's slightly different from, from the precision. And, um, okay, so here you can see slight, the predictive power of, of, of the SVM. Here, only using, here what you're seeing is actually the predictive power by using only attributes that belong to these respective uh, layers. So here the best predictions were actually uh, conducted on, were obtained using the magnetics layers, and uh, from in general, this here, I can't remember what type of magnetics was this, but this was the, the worst. Uh, faults, here, usually faults is supposed to have very good predictive power, so 
we we started to wonder if we've made any errors in in the in the counting or how we we summarized the faults that cross through each cell. So here probably we had some issues here. Um, nevertheless, though the, these so this is the prediction using on on the test blocks. So it's pretty high. We're able to to actually predict pretty well all the existing deposits and then capable of actually coming up with the uh, with the candidate locations which were very interesting um, so uh, so the second analysis was to generate a predictive model with the most informative attributes so from here we we selected the 14 attributes which were actually the 14 attributes that we use for the S for the sum okay and and here so the original so originally we had 64 positives and 4847 negatives and so applying SMOTE, we oversampled this uh, 64 to 320 and undersampled this to 320. This was repeated several times to generate different 320s uh, negatives. And roughly the results didn't change that much. So the accuracy was pretty high. And, uh, and this meant here that when we applied the model then over the whole, over the whole grid, uh, it was able to predict correctly uh, imposing a threshold here. So after the performance was measured, all the 640 training examples were used to train the SVM and then evaluate the resulting model in the 4,911 cells of the north of Chile. And so then by using a cutoff probability of 0 0.75, the original 64 deposits were identified, as well as nine new cells, which were our candidate locations to be explored. So this was very interesting because then when we applied the model and we, we, we set this, we found this cut point by using the ROC curve, the rock uh, operating curve, the receiver operating curve, we found this threshold here was, was relevant and um, basically, we were able to find, with this cutoff probability, we could predict correctly all the existing uh, deposits. And uh, these nine new ones, we compared to the ones that, the predictions that were done by the other groups in the discovery room. And from those nine, I think there were like two, probably three of those points which were actually uh, matched with some of the results obtained by the other groups. So that was quite promising because you, then you had more than a couple of groups that uh, were actually predicting as areas of, of interest uh, at least two points, uh, two cells in, in, in this model. Uh, well, here I probably left out that we also tested for different sizes of cells and uh, not also not necessarily square, also circular cells as well. And um, here I, w I wanted to put uh, the actual projection of the results on the GIS system with the formal coordinates and the results of the other people. But uh, we did sign a non-disclosure agreement. So uh, I left all of those um, picture, nice pictures out. And I'm only showing you a, a picture which we plotted using R. Uh, and so here are, are the red dots represent the, the known deposits. And, and the color here bar represents the, the probabilities. Here's the light blue is the 0 0.75. Uh, this, this actually was from another simulation, though, not the one that I, I was talking before, but just to have a general idea. Here, the actual visual, visualization in the discovery room was projected on, on, on basically having the, the satellite image of the north of Chile and uh, with the actual coordinates and the results from the other teams. And it looked pretty neat, but uh, I can't show you that because or else my life uh, go, becomes in, goes in danger. OK, so um, to sum up, basically, we see here three different data uh, mining or data approaches for, for, explore, for exploring. Uh, they weren't picked randomly. Essentially, we, we, we tackled the, this problem depending on the actual the availability of the, of the data. Um, so for each case, potential target areas of explorations were identified. Um, although the three techniques were analyzed separately, there are options of combining them. Of course, for example, the density field of the deposits could be used to generate a, co a density, uh, a color map 
on top of the predicted target areas by the, by the SOM or the SVM. Okay, so combine the two results. Um, this could also be special interest for target areas that contain uh, covered areas or patches with no knowledge, available data. So there are some predictions that you, you can make. On, there are some areas in the north of Chile where you don't have any information and no satellite information and so on because they're covered and so and, and, and some areas seem to be interesting but with the, with the models uh, like SVM or so on, you can't do any prediction because you don't have any data to input the model. So here you can probably use information of of this density uh, with the fractal dimension and so on. And um, future work will consider, uh, consist in analyzing selected new target areas and reduce the size of the target area to enter into a new exploration phase. So here in, in this, so this actually ended by mid-2013. Last year, 2014, we, we sort of started um, in a, um, working on the second phase, on the second phase which were limited areas and so on, but then the company started, because they were, uh, they were now in Chile, they started to buy uh, land and so on, and so they started to, to, they had other priorities, so we were put on standby for now. So that was it, basically. Thank you. <laughs>